in the economy, or in what is termed the internet economy, we have something that I term the internet gift commodity economy. So on the one hand we have gifts, something is given for free on the uh, internet, uh, there are potentials for free sharing uh, on, on the internet, like file sharing, or uh, take for example the uh, open, open source movement, uh, the free software movement, and on the other hand there's competition, and there's the commodity. Uh, capital is accumulated with the help of uh, the internet. And I think uh, now a shift has taken place on the internet. Many peop people talk about Web 2.0, social software, and so on. And I like to frame this as an intermingling or such an encroachment of uh, the free sharing, which is the cooperative side, uh, and uh, the commodity side, uh, but under the dominance of the logic of competition. So this to pose a, 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 a mixing somehow, but there's a dominance uh, of the uh, competitive uh, logic. Uh, and I term this the internet gift commodity economy, but you can also uh, phrase it in terms uh, of Taylor Smythe uh, in his category of the audience commodity. And what he was, was Smythe, what Smythe was actually saying, I mean, the talk about the internet, he wrote uh, his paper on the audience commodity um, 25 years ago, but he was talking about traditional media and he was saying there's exploitation going on there and alien, alienation, not just those workers who produce the cultural goods that we consume in media formats, but uh, also the audience is being exploited because it is sold as a commodity to advertising clients and then capital can be uh, accumulated and profits uh, are actually made. So what he's telling us is that the audience is being exploited by the media indus industries. Uh, and I think this notion pretty good fits to, uh, to this Web 2.0 uh, so-called web 2.0 applications like YouTube, MySpace, uh, Facebook, Facebook uh, and so on, because what people do there is uh, they have free, uh, they are given free access to it. So actually, the, the free, sh the idea of free sharing, giving free access, is very uh, in important here. But at the same time, they are also commodified. Uh, they put as user-generated content, and they are sold as a commodity to advertisement. Uh, clients of these corporations like uh, Mur Murdoch, Google, uh, and so on. So the difference between the traditional audience commodity and the new media audience commodity is that here we have so-called prosumers or producers, as uh, Axel Holmes uh, is, uh, is saying. They are, produ in my uh, terms, uh, they produce surplus value and are uh, exploited uh, by capital. So whenever we Google uh, on the internet or upload videos on YouTube or update our profiles on MySpace and Facebook uh, and so on, we constitute an audience commodity. We are exploited by capital, which also means that all people uh, are today uh, exploited, or at least all internet users. You could also apply a notion to other realms of, uh, of society. Therefore, also the distinction between productive and unproductive labor in marginal terms uh, no longer uh, exists. So all activity, how much is it? Five minutes. Five minutes. So all activity then becomes productive. Uh, and uh, I think that the difference here is that uh, if you compare it to TV or, or radio, that in, on the internet you have active and creative uh, indivi individuals who are prosumers, they uh, engage in user-generated con con uh, content, but this is perfectly compatible with uh, a capitalist system uh, of exploitation uh, and profit generation. And therefore, I don't speak of the audience commodity, but uh, a term that I've created uh, of the prosumer commodity. But it pretty much relates to uh, what Smythe uh, in his critical political economy was saying. And also this advertising business on the internet, it's really uh, a, a business uh, so I have found a statistic here and it shows that there has been a rapid growth uh, of the internet advertising profits uh, in the US and in 2007 uh, this amounted to more than uh, 20 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, therefore, I also think that in terms of critical theory, Brecht, Benjamin, and later in the 70s, Enzensberger, they were also talking uh, about these prosumers and they imagined uh, the emergence of a media democracy. Uh, and I think uh, actually this hypothesis has been falsified because today we see uh, that the prosumer has emerged, but it's compatible uh, and even becomes an imminent part of uh, the capitalist system. So, they somehow were wrong in uh, these 
uh, assumptions. And all of this is based on personalized advertisements and for uh, making this possible then you also need certain privacy policies uh, which normally nobody reads but uh, I have an example from a, a German platform where it's the same uh, as Facebook uh, so actually uh, the advertisement is very uh, shaped towards the individual uh, and very uh, personalized. And I also think that this whole situation is a reactualization of uh, what Marx termed the antagonism between the productive forces and the relations of production. Why? Because I think information has certain features. It is hard to control in single places or by single owners. It's intangible. It can be easily copied and distributed by global technological uh, networks that strive for establishing uh, connections. Uh, so this shows us that this aspect of sharing, of uh, sharing information, giving it for free as gift is really an, an, an imminent feature of uh, information and, it's, uh, and, and, and by uh, informational uh, networks. Uh, but at the same time, so for me th this would then also mean uh, that the network productive forces to point towards uh, a communist society and anticipate such a society, society but uh, these productive forces remain entangled within uh, capitalist relations of production and they are perfectly compatible uh, with it and are even used for, uh, for advancing uh, exp exp expo exp exploitation and therefore you have such an uh, in Antagonism, uh, as Marx has described it. Okay, uh, one word about Manuel Castells, who will be talking later today with Ariel Turin, and tomorrow his big talk. Manuel Castells has been writing in 2006 that this antagonism is the only lasting contribution from classical Marxist theory. You can forget everything else from Marxist theory, but this antagonism uh, is important still. Uh, I think Castells is totally wrong here. I think because this antagonism is right, it's very topical, this antagonism, but this antagonism contains really all of Marxism, uh, because all other categories that Marx has uh, elaborated, exploitation, class and so on, they are the foundation for this antagonism. And so the, the antagonism is the top of the whole Marxian theory and therefore I would not say it's the only limit but uh, it's the only lasting contribution uh, but the antagonism and also the internet and alienation on the internet show us that, shows us that uh, Marxian theory is so important uh, today. And then one word about Slavoj Zizek. Uh, Slavoj Zizek was uh, writing a book about Lenin some years ago and he claimed there that Lenin was the inventor of the internet and of cyberspace that he uh, wrote a theory of the World Wide Web. I think that also Zizek was wrong because I think not Lenin invented the internet but Karl Marx invented uh, the internet in the Grundrisse because there uh, he writes about or he anticipates, he just imagines a global information network in which everyone attempts to inform himself on others and where connections are introduced all of the time. And I think this is a pretty good uh, description of what we today term cyberspace or, uh, or internet, internet and therefore my a little bit provo provocative claim is that Karl Marx invented the internet and that Slavoj Zizek was wrong in claiming it was Lenin because already in 1850 uh, Marx was writing about uh, the internet. Uh, and here's the whole uh, quotation but I don't go into any uh, details here. Maybe one word uh, about Critical theory, I mean, Michael Gurevoy will also be talking here tomorrow and on Monday and he was talking about, he's talking about public sociology and by public sociology he means doing sociology in the public realm, uh, but uh, he's using a distinction between uh, instrumental and reflexive knowledge uh, and then he this results in a typology of four types of sociology and he's uh, basing this distinction on Horkheimer and Adorno but, uh, and this also results in the fact that Bernard is saying that public sociology can also support Christian fundamentalism and it's still public sociology. And I think he got it wrong here because for Horkheimer and Adorno the distinction was not between instrumental and reflexive knowledge but between instrumental and critical knowledge. And critical knowledge is something different from just reflexive knowledge because this means being partial for the oppressed, uh, doing left-wing sociology that uh, stands up against oppression. Therefore I think the typology is good, but it should be improved. Uh, and therefore, uh, 
I think we need to insert here critical knowledge, and then this means critical sociology in the academic uh, realm. Uh, is social research conducted in the interest of the abolishment of all types of alienation, you could, you could say. And doing the same in the public realm, then would be public critical sociology. I think that uh, this whole framework uh, is also important when we talk about the internet. And probably I should stop here. Thanks. Okay.